Uh, good afternoon, everyone. As Rania said, my name is Armi Bayot, and I'm a first-year doctor of uh, philosophy in law student here at Oxford. Um, my research here at Oxford is on peace agreements. Peace agreements are documents through which groups who are at war with each other agree to put the war to an end and to begin an era of peace. So what does law have to do with that? Um, my research here at Oxford it has to do with understanding precisely that. What does law have to say with the quality of peace agreements, for instance? What does law have to say with um, the relationship of the parties who signed the peace agreement? And uh, for today's talk, I'm also interested in what the law has to say about those who weren't invited to the peace process and who didn't sign the peace agreement, but whose lives <coughs> will be affected by whatever is in that peace agreement. Um, you might be wondering why I'm very interested in this topic, what has brought me to this research question and why, why do I care so much about this? Um, let me tell you a little bit about myself first, um, my background and how I came to these questions. So before I came to Oxford, I was a lawyer for my government, that's the government of the Republic of the Philippines. And I was very privileged to be part of a peace negotiation team that was in talks with a rebel group called the Moro Islamic Liberation Front. Um, after 17 years of negotiations, I came in, I think, on the 11th year. Um, we were able to finally put an end to an armed conflict in the Philippines that had been going on for 40 years. And um, I'm very uh, privileged to say that I helped draft this peace agreement. I helped in the face-to-face -face negotiations with the rebel group. And I'm probably one of the few people in the world whose signature is on a peace agreement. When this peace agreement was signed in 2014, it was the most important peace agreement that was signed in that time. And this is the first peace agreement in the world which was signed by my former boss. Um, it's the first peace agreement in the world that was signed by a female chief negotiator. So as you can see, this is a very big part of my professional life before coming to Oxford. So, but uh, before we come to a peace agreement, I have to talk to you about what the conflict was about. So just to um, orient ourselves on where my country is. So I'm here in the Asia Pacific area and that's the Philippines over there. Um, I think that's the orange bit in that map. There are many conflicts in the Philippines, but the conflict uh, in particular, wherein uh, we had the peace negotiations, have to do with this area over here. It's called, um, it's um, the island of Mindanao. It's actually an island group, including the Sulu archipelago. So what are the roots of conflict in this particular island? The Philippines was under Spanish colonial rule for 300 years. And in 1898, uh, Spain ceded the entire archipelago of the Philippines to the United States of America. Now, the funny thing about that is Mindanao was never under the effective control of Spain. And um, by a mere uh, instrument signed in another country, uh, the people of Mindanao suddenly had to become part of a new entity, the, the Philippines, which would soon become the Republic of the Philippines. Um, what happened to the island of Mindanao when it came uh, under Philippine rule? This island has always been regarded by, the, by central government as a political and economic backwater. It was underdeveloped. It was not a priority of the Philippine government, which led the way to um, land dispossession and warlordism. Um, this area is um, populated by two indigenous groups. One is called the, the Bangsamoro, and the other are called the Lumad. So the main difference between these two groups is that the Bangsamoro are Islamized ethnic groups, and the Lumads are those who didn't convert to Islam. Uh, what was the reaction or the response of the Bangsamoro to the neglect of the Philippine government? Uh, they embarked on a rebellion against the Philippine government, while the Lumads, on the other hand, did not participate in active rebellion against the Philippine government. They instead lobbied for a protective law, which they successfully had enacted in 1997. In around 1975, the Philippine government uh, felt that it could not win the war against the Bangsamoro without too much loss of life 
and um, property. And that's when we embarked on the 40 years of peace negotiation with the Bangsamoro. Uh, what does the peace agreement with the Bangsamoro uh, aim to do? Well, of course, because it's a peace agreement, it aims to establish a permanent ceasefire. A, a condition wherein both sides will forever commit not to, do, to commit armed hostilities against each other. But in return for that commitment, there is the commitment to share power with um, the representatives of the Moro group. That's basically how a peace agreement, modern peace agreement works these days. And that includes the peace agreement that we signed in 2014. And it was really big news at the time because uh, we were putting an end to armed conflict that had claimed so many lives. Um, and we were very proud of that. But I was very, at the back of my mind, I was always concerned about the fact that this particular uh, area in the Philippines, the island of Mindanao, is being shared by the Bangsamoro and the Lumad. We never invited the Lumads to the peace process. They never sat with us in the negotiations. And yet we talked about their rights and negotiated about what their lives will be like when the peace agreement was signed. When you look at the peace agreement, you will notice at least two major areas of concern for the Lumads. First is that there is no outright recognition of their ancestral land. If you remember, I mentioned a while ago that they already enacted, had enacted uh, a protective law that assured them of their lands that they have had since time immemorial, lands that have never become part of the, uh, of the Philippine land, uh, public land. But there is no acknowledgement of that in the peace agreement. And um, more importantly, the peace agreement also said that their rights will be under the exclusive power of the new Bangsamoro government. And it's that latter thing that has always um, concerned me. How could we have negotiated on the rights of people who weren't even involved in the peace process? So my research at Oxford is this. Um, I want to understand what laws could possibly apply to the peace agreement and to peace processes that would not result in such undemocratic results. And so far, my research has showed that there are so many in, uh, laws, international legal regimes, that talk about war. We have a lot of wars that talk about just causes for embarking on war. We, we have so many laws on what you can and cannot do during war. The amount of force that you are allowed to do, the amount of damage that you're allowed to do without incurring any international liability. But there is hardly any law that talks about how to make peace. There is hardly any law that talks about how to do a peace process and how to measure who gets to sit at the peace table. And for me, this is not just um, uh, an academic question. Uh, for me. Uh, this, this is what drives me to continue with my research because there are many peace processes around the world and we have to learn from the lessons that we have had in the Philippines. To date, there are 1,500 peace agreements uh, from, signed from 1990 to 2014 in around 140 peace processes. And in many of those, I can tell you that there are people whose lives are affected by the text who were not invited in the talks. And uh, well, that's where I end my talk today. And I hope uh, I was able to explain a little bit about the background of my research and what I intend to do. So thank you.